boy, budge. We like to view what other people are doing, uh, particularly within our own social group, and then we'll behave in that way. And I think uh, that's, that's the crux, really, of behavioural science and, and even economics, is that education programmes, information programmes, can crank up responses by single-digit percentage outcomes, you know, sometimes even 0.1% in the case of the US financial literacy program, according to studies. In that day-to-day -day life piece, aside from getting your sons to we in the right place, do you actually use it? I mean, you're a behavioral scientist. Do you use it in your daily life with, in any other way, particularly around parenting? Yes, there's millions that I could go into. But... <laughs> Hang on, do, do you, are you using it on me right now? In this episode of Budge, How to Fudge Being Human, we talk to Alex Giani from the original Nudge Unit, Now Behavioral Insights, Global Leaders in Applied Behavioral Science. Alex is the Australian director of the team that pioneered the use of behavioural science to improve communities' lives by helping government and the private sector tackle their biggest challenges. We hope you love this episode as much as we do. And subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, or wherever you're listening. Thanks, Alex Gianni, so much for joining us, mate. Really appreciate it. Apologies, um, you've got to sit next to Darren for the next 20, 30 minutes or so. Wondering hands. We'll make do. <laughs> Alex, um, we, we've obviously been really keen to get you on the podcast for a while because you're doing some amazing work in behavioral science, the behavioral insights team. And, and rather than give you sort of a long introduction, I was wondering if maybe you could explain to us what exactly the behavioral insights team is and, and, and where you guys came from. Because, you know, you're global these days, but you started from, you know, a, what, a brilliant idea by a, a British politician or, or was it somewhere else? Uh, so it was in the UK. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's really exciting to be here, Paul and Darren. Um, yeah, I think generally we love talking about these ideas. So um, yeah, it's fun to spend the next half hour kind of talking about how we get behavioral insights out there. And it's probably worth starting right at the beginning. So as you mentioned, yeah, we did start off in the UK in 2010, um, actually as a, uh, a policy unit within number 10 Downing Street. So if you think back to the context of 2010 uh, in the UK, we just come out of the global financial crisis, as it's known in Australia. In the UK, as I'm sure you remember, Darren, it was the, the Great Recession. Great Recession, uh, yeah. It was a, a great, I thought yeah. it was a great shit show, but that's probably the current situation with Brexit and uh, everything else. Uh, mm. It's all getting sorted this week, mate. <laughs> <laughs> just like that. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think we did. It, it really wasn't great for very many people, right? So the key thing was, like, you come out of this um, this recession, well, we were still in it in 2010, and at the time, in the UK at least, we had a coalition government, different to the coalition that we have here in Australia, uh, between the Conservative Party, who are sort of centre-right, and the Liberal Democrats, who are centre-left. Yeah. So they just replaced the Labour government, which, you know, in the traditional Labour government way, were known as being much more interventionist in terms of using legislation. Um, and uh, that is one of the key tools the government has to change sort of people's behaviour, and a lot of government is about changing people's behaviour. Um, and then... And, and so I should probably just... I mean, that was a very unique thing for British politics. For people watching it that don't know British politics, we literally had the marriage of two very different parties, which we probably haven't had either ever or since the 19th century. Um, it, it was quite an unusual situation, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it's the 70s at least, I think, in terms of that sort of arrangement. Um, and I think because it was quite shocked, there was a lot of scrambling around to kind of find new ideas. Um, so as I said, yeah, post the GFC, people were losing a lot of trust in terms of what economics could do for them, which is another sort of standard government tool. So if, if people aren't doing what you want, then, you know, either offer subsidies or taxes to change people's behaviour. So if you're starting to question those sort of fundamental tools of government, then there was this scramble of ideas and also quite a unique um, situation, as you say, Paul. So there was one thing that came, sort of came through, which was we need to come up with different ways in which we can look at behaviour change. And almost serendipitously, this book Nudge, written by uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, um, was floating around uh, actually the, the shadow cabinet. Uh, so uh, George Osborne was a big fan of that. So that's the ex-Chancellor um, of the Exchequer, so the equivalent to the Treasurer here. Um, so that was sort of where these ideas started coming out. It's like, actually, how can we use some of the ideas in psychology, behavioral economics, anthropology to change behavior? Um, partly because, you know, for the last century or so, people have been studying human behaviour, so it's important to, to use that knowledge to for good and for public policy, because it, it works. How much of this was driven by David Cameron and, and actually by the GFC? Because obviously, um, the other great thing that we remember 
David Cameron for was this this philosophy of big society where he effectively wanted to reach out to all branches of the community society to pull them in to sort of support things so there's less government intervention. So to what extent was the utilization of nudge theory um, you know, part of his thinking and part of um this this re- reaction to the GFC and the fact that, you know, he, he was trying to fake not having to use austerity in that post GFC period. Yeah, I mean, as with anything, there's multiple sort of stories that go through this. There's actually a longer story on the sort of public service side, uh, which led to this. So actually our CEO, David Halpin, and he documents this all in his book, Inside the Nudge Unit, which he'll probably thank me for plugging here. Uh, but it's genuinely <laughs> oh, a really... Unit by, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by, by uh, David Halpin. Um, but no, it's genuinely a very interesting book in terms of telling the story of this. Um, so basically there were some attempts to kind of think about how we can use the theories from social psychology and public policy back into sort of the early 2000s. Um, but they were seen as quite controversial at the time, um, partly because, you know, it was just the way in which they were perceived in the media or are seen as being a little bit too interventionist. Mm. Um, so that's sort of the current story that was threads through. And, and actually, David at the time was working for uh, Tony Blair in the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit. So these ideas were there in the Whitehall establishment. Um, but they just quite had, hadn't found their place yet. Uh, so David Cameron and uh, uh, George Osborne and actually his, um, one of his, uh, special advisors, Ryan Silver, were really big drivers of these ideas. So it's sort of, as with any sort of big innovation, one of the key things is that you've got the right people in place and you've got the right processes in place that actually allow that idea to flow through. It's not really a story of, of one thing. Um, sadly, as, as you know, it's, it's always a bit more complicated. Well, I think it's good. It was the, you know, the GFC and crisis that really pushed trying new things and and the the reassurance of the behavioural economics in, in the book nudge mm. um, gave, gave a bit of validity to it. But I think I remember meeting you guys first. It must have been about 2011 when you moved to the Treasury. Mm. So, and there was only about five or six people there. Um, and I think you were there by then, mm. at least um, uh, part-timing or finishing yeah. your PhD. Uh, Rory Gallagher, Sam and Goyen, and, and all three of them are still working oh, wow. um, hard, aren't they, with the Behavioural Insights team around the world? Yeah, Sam's, Sam's now um, actually somewhere, somewhere else. Well, that, just to back, back up in, exactly but, uh, yeah. what I said, uh, <laughs> yes, Sam's not You're there. on the ball, Dad, as always, ahead and, of the game. this is um, Dr. Alex Gianni. Oh, we should, we should emphasize, yeah, he was finishing his PhD. Or, um, or the Ali G of behavioral <laughs> science, as he's known throughout the world. <laughs> um, so he's very proud of that. that. <laughs> but there was just a sense of kind of potential and possibility and excitement. And, and when, sometimes when I talk to you now, that's actually still there. Like, oh, look at this that we found, or look at this that we're doing. And it's actually... Um, you don't often find that with policy and policy influencing, particularly when you talk to politicians or, or policy advisors. Um, but but there's a set of, there's just this sense of oh, we can actually make meaningful, positive, ethical, behavioural change here with with some of the you know backed by science. And I might I might jump in there, mate, because I suppose before we talk a little bit more about the story of behavioural insights, just for anyone listening, let's give an example of what this stuff actually is you know what what does the behavioral insights team do what, what is nudge theory J- just to make it sort of a bit e- easier to understand because it is something it's quite complex yeah what's your favorite nudge so i mean i think <laughs> we start to go back to the sort of one of the big ones that i think really kicked us off it was some of the work that we did in tax which traditionally is an area where i mean there is some innovation in the policy space but um i think it's just an area where you've got lots of smart people working um but some of the processes are a little bit freaky so <laughs> it's one of the most boring things in the world i'm glad so you, you said that yeah, yeah. got this excitement what is it the only three things certain in life was it birth death and taxes or something like that i failed two so, exams in my life bring a bit of excitement to age old oh totally um, that's what I said. I failed two ta- ta- failed two exams in my life, mate. One was my first driving test, and one was my tax accounting exam. It's uh, <laughs> I just couldn't stay awake. I'm going to stop asking you for advice then in future. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah, no well, the taxes. Well, so, I mean, I think the, the key thing, I mean, the reason why we're so fascinated about this is that if you're looking at human behaviour, it is a fascinating thing, right? That's why you're doing this podcast. That's why you have lots of listeners and viewers. Um, so one of the key things that we found there was the letters that go out. They're a little bit unclear. You know, you get them after you've done your tax return, you're told that you need to kind of do your, your self-assessment. Um, I'm just going to ask you this. This is a change, just so I know, in Australia, we always do tax returns 
in yeah. the UK, since I've lived in Australia, I understand that that's now become a British thing too. The British do tax returns. Is that right? So most people don't actually. So okay. it's, right. it's if you are a high net worth individual or you're self-employed. Um, right, okay. That's yeah. Tax return or you own a lot of property. Um, so you need to do that. Right. So it's definitely not the norm. It's definitely not the norm in the same way that it is in the UK. So what we did was we looked at a bunch of people who had not um, paid their tax yet or done their, their self-assessment, and we sent them a letter. Uh, the letter was the normal one, but then what we did was we experimented with it, and we had a line that said, nine out of ten people pay their tax on time, which what? actually is an example of what we call a descriptive social norm which yeah. essentially, it, to break down the jargon, the descriptive is, is that you're telling people about what is happening um, and you're telling them about what, what people in your sort of normative group are doing. So that's what the social norm is. The descriptive thing is, this is what other people are doing. And what we found was that the inclusion of that message significantly increased the number of people who paid their tax. Uh, the nine out of 10 figure is, is true, uh, which is obviously really important from the ethical standpoint. Um, but yeah, that that message was really powerful in bringing forward uh, payment. So in terms of numbers, if it was scaled up, we're looking at about £200 million of money being brought forward and real savings of about uh, £30 million, which actually is worth a lot more then than it is now. Um, <laughs> but the reason why this is important is that actually a lot of the discussion at the time was around how do we focus on some of those policy levers but actually just tightening up some of the implementation, some of the basic processes that you use in government can be a really powerful way to eke out small but important gains if they're delivered yeah. over sort of large, large groups. And I assume a few things about this is that the cost of actually making those changes to the letters were significantly small compared to the gain that you got. And, and so, yeah, it's basically the cost of ink and changing those letters yeah. is you know, a couple of thousand. Wow. Um, and, and I guess the other part is, I'm, I'm going to put this in, you, you know, you two are the sort of doctor sort of behavioral science geniuses, and I'm just this dozy accountant. When you say that, do you know the name Gyani in from the original Sanskrit, but then into Punjabi and Hindi means genius or wise person or, or holder of all knowledge. Um, that's something just straight off the top of my head. I didn't look it up at all. Do you know what's difficult about this, Alex, is I never know when he's being serious anymore. That is true. That's true, is it? But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I might Google what cop in me. Hang on, which bit? <laughs> the origin and the name or the fact that you, you know it all? Um, <laughs> both. Both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I should, I'm going to Google what cop in means in Welsh, mate. I'm sure there's a few interesting variations. It's actually a Welsh name. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Dazza. Hell. Small hill or lump. <laughs> so, and again, in layman's terms then, effectively what we're saying is by writing to these people who hadn't paid their taxes, you were saying, look, you don't, be you don't belong to what the normal group of people do. Your, your behaviour is not normal. So it's interesting you use the word belong there because I think there's a subtle mm. thing there, which is that it is that your behaviour is out of keeping with a group that actually you do belong to. Uh, so it really taps into that idea of identity. Yeah. Um, so we generally view a certain identity and if we are not acting in line with that then we will kind of moderate our behavior in that way so the reason why that's important is that actually if you change that norm to be more specific so nine out of ten people in your local area with a debt like yours then it becomes more effective yeah. but uh yeah basically in principle that's exactly right is that we like to view what other people are doing uh particularly within our own social group and then we'll behave in that in that way and i think um, that's that's the crux really of of, of behavioral science and, and even economics is that you're you're not just you know education programs information programs can crank up responses by by single digit percentage um outcomes you know sometimes even 0.1 percent in the case of the u.s financial literacy program according to studies whereas if you start tapping into people's basic behavioural survival, even down to the limbic system <laughs> responses and saying you're outside of the norm here, this is how you get back in uh, to, to, to belonging, if you, to use your parlance, that really taps in. So you're still providing information in a solid ethical and, and governmental kind of way, but it's actually tapping into those really base human survival instincts. Yeah, okay. And, and, and is there, away from tax, is there other examples of where you, you two have come across this? So, uh, again, in layman's terms, uh, are there other examples where, you know, we should belong to a social group, but our behaviour isn't akin to that, but by, we can actually nudge people to change their behaviour so they feel that they have to do something to belong? 
Oh, 100%. I mean, this is probably one of the most bankable findings that you can find in terms of yeah. uh, in terms of behavioral insights. So the use of social norms. Uh, there was a recent example that we did in, in New Zealand a couple of years ago where we were sending that message uh, message out to GPs who were over prescribers of antibiotics, basically telling ah, them you are which, in the top. Which is a huge global issue, right? Which is a, a huge global issue. Uh, I know it'll be an issue that will continue to be the case. Uh, regardless of when you're listening to this. And then, sorry, uh, just to clarify, for, for people listening to this, that um, obviously there, there are some people out on the web that we're effectively losing the, 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 the power of antibiotics because they're oversubscribed, that they're not having the impact on, you know, medical uh, interventions they used to have. 100%. And actually, uh, at the end of 2019, the WHO put out a list of, like, here are the top 10 existential threats that we're going to face in yep. the next, you know, decade or so. Um, number one was an influenza epidemic, which is obviously what we saw come through in terms of COVID. And then just below that, it was uh, treatment resistant bugs caused by antimicrobial resistance, which is wow. sort of due to the overuse of antibiotics, you end yeah. up with these super bugs. Well, so um, one of my interests about this is that, you know, the nudge you're about to tell me is literally something that's, you know, taxation is one thing, helping governments with revenue, but the nudge you're about to talk about is something that's quite hugely impacting in the future of, of society and humanity. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, so, and, and it's pretty much exactly the same thing. So we're, sell, we're telling GPs that they are prescribing more than their peers. Um, right. And what we did in New Zealand, it was based on some work actually that was originally done in the UK, um, was telling them in their local area, that's what it means. But then in New Zealand, you also have a, an important issue in that Maori patients can also be under-prescribed antibiotics. Wow. So you actually want to create this nudge or this letter that we wrote that basically reduces overall antibiotic prescriptions, but doesn't put vulnerable people at risk. So yeah. we actually get a more targeted um, social norm by breaking down here's what your sort of prescribing behavior looks like for different population groups. Mm. And what we saw there was that overall that reduced the number of antibiotic prescriptions by about 9%. Um, but for those GPs who may have over-prescribed for the general population, but under-prescribed for Maori groups, is that they didn't change their prescribing behaviour for uh, the Maori uh, the Maori patients they saw, which is quite a sort of surgical mm. nudge, but it looks quite blunt, right, in terms of the letter that you're seeing. Yeah. Uh, but it's really we really spent a lot of time designing that um, to have that that impact. We probably, we probably now need that letter going to every GP on the planet, right? Um, yeah, and, and keep changing. I mean, and then there's also other areas where you can see a lot of the, the use of antibiotics. So like in uh, agriculture. Um, yeah. So GPs are chosen because that's where a lot of the, the, the antibiotics are given. But there's lots of areas where we can try these, these ideas. But the key thing is that like that social norm, it's a very sort of specific tool. But what we've done is applied it to areas that look quite different. So yeah. one of the key things that I find really interesting is how do you scale these ideas and how do you kind of work out what I call like the behavioral formulation of an issue, which is in this case that there's a group of people doing something that's out of the norm, out of the norm, but is detrimental. And if you then send that norm back to them, then they realign their behavior. And there's probably lots of different areas where we're seeing that, where people think that their behavior is the normal sort of what other people are doing, but actually just some simple information can correct that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And one of the nudges that you you love the most that I told you about once years ago was the um, was this you, at a bar or a bar at a pub or something? Uh, yeah. Well, if you think you're being watched, you behave differently. So, yeah. if, in your example, if you're in a bar, think someone's looking at you, you suck your stomach in. Yes. Um, but you. It was the <laughs> the Newcastle Uni, you know, the menus where people had to um, to uh, to all the price list for food in the refectory had to um, uh, get, it was an honesty box system and people weren't giving in enough. But when you stuck a pair of eyes on the uh, on the price list, they did. Then there was extended to you know washing your hands. It doubled the number of people that that sanitised their hands in a healthcare environment. If you above the sanitizer had a pair of stern looking man's eyes. Um, it was there, and, and actually the lemon scent. So that doubled the number of people that sanitized their hands, and it tripled the number if you had a lemon scent. Um, um, so really subliminal cues, but that those eyes looking and, and, and acting differently. If people look at you. It's a really obvious thing that we all, all know, but um, to be able to harness it and implement it to improve healthcare or, or whatever and, and change behavior is is quite profound. It is quite fun. Yeah. So I think some of the eye stuff is sort of coming under question now, right? In terms of some of the replication. Uh, for 
we want to jump into the application crisis, but that's uh, yeah. Yes, uh, I mean, yeah, I've I've uh, tried putting a pair of eyes on the top of my toilet lid. Yeah. So that Ollie, we tried the um, the fly, like the uh, Shippo Airport one. <laughs> yeah, uh, this, my, this my is five... Ollie's your son. Is this again? You yeah, actually yeah. done this at home, Dave? Yeah. And and instead of uh, instead of getting him to aim better in the toilet, it's actually giving him stage fright. So I'm calling it into question. <laughs> Is that yeah. what you meant, Alex? Uh, I mean, <laughs> Probably not quite the example you meant. <laughs> key thing, I mean, the key thing with a lot of the stuff, the reason why we know that these things work is that we, we do quite a lot of trials uh, and quite often we'll use something called a randomised control trial, yeah. uh, which yeah. is essentially borrowed from the clinical space where you would take a group of people, uh, you would randomly allocate them to either a treatment group or a control group, and then you'd, for the treatment group, you'd give them your... Um, interventional or whatever you want to term it, in this case, the social norms letter, and then you would measure at the end of it what the difference between the treatment and the control group is. So all the the, the examples I'm giving now have gone under that rigorous scrutiny. Um, I think, I mean, the anecdote I think is is great and a really uh, good way of telling the story. Um, But I think the key thing for us is making sure that that does actually have the impact that we hope it does. Yeah, exactly. But what you've found, I mean, once you've Done an undertaken a randomized control trial or a mm. pilot and evidence that wow this really seems to work and, and, and make a positive difference and then often you you have to scale it up mm. um, and roll it out across entire departments or, or states or countries it, has that been easy the the scaling up uh in short no and actually and if you're leading onto this paper here that i actually got a prop of uh so there's a recent paper, paper and um, <laughs> it has been published by uh, seamless paul seamless oh, we get good at this yeah. <laughs> um but it's a really important paper and i think it jumps into mm. the the ideas that you're talking about um on how do you actually make sure that these ideas are adopted because as you say it's, it's all well and good that you demonstrate that it works and even though the trials that we're talking about do are conducted on quite large groups of, of, of people, which is important to have that impact. Um, if it just stops there, then it's not going to have any further impact. Mm-hmm. So the key thing is actually how do you create that adoption and that scaling of it? And um, it's this paper here that will be put in the show notes um, by Stefano de Lavinia, uh, Wu Jin Kim, and Liz Linos, who actually used to work for our team in, in the US, uh, has studied um, of the trials that have been run largely in the US, actually entirely in the US. It's part of a big program that they were doing there. Um, which ones then get scaled up? So do you sort of use that example of a tax letter? Then like, does that happen every year? Um, so that's sort of the ideas that they were looking at. And what they found was that about 27% of the nudges that were trialed um, were scaled up. I think... 27%. 27%. And that's that's 27% of the successful ones? Uh, so not all of them were successful. Those are all the ones that they looked at. Mm. Um, it wasn't much more, was it? Even for the really positive outcome ones, it was in the 30%. Yeah, exactly right. So, yeah, it wasn't ideal, uh, to be to be frank. Uh, but I do think like, there are some things that we can kind of reflect on, which is that is still progress. Right? Mm. You don't want to say that... Uh, you know, it's uh, the best situation that it could be. The best situation would be significantly higher than that. It'd be all the ones that worked. Um, but it is still progress. And we know that some of these things are effective. So that's great. Uh, but it does kind of get you to question, you know, how do we make sure that these mm. ideas do take scale? And kind of reflecting on some of the interesting things that came out of it. Because it's not just like, are things that are effective scaled? Are the things that aren't effective not scaled? And one of the things that they did find is that things that were shown not to be effective were actually taken forward. <laughs> <laughs> I see a small problem here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that, I think, is a bit of an issue. I mean, it's worth kind of going back to that and thinking about what does that actually mean? Because, I mean, quite often we can see some ideas that then get, you know, get put forward and get kind of take, take hold in, a, in an organisation. And they may be, like, not effective, but, you know, an executive may think that that's sort of it's a great idea, it's a great phrase that we're using in an email or a letter or a text. So why not do that anyway? And that's like fair enough, I guess. Um, it, it, speaks, it speaks to me of one of those things where somebody's had an idea, and when we do this with dads and we do this with so many parts in life, someone's had an idea where they love the idea so much that despite the evidence saying like it doesn't do anything, they can't let go of the idea. Therefore, they have to kind of keep pursuing it irrespective of of the data. 
what I find fascinating, so to, to sum up here what the findings were is that great, you do a, an RCT, randomized control uh, trial, and uh, say a third of them are taken forward that are successful. Some are taken forward that, that weren't successful. But why those two thirds not take? So that's the key. Why weren't they taken forward or more, perhaps more effectively, a bit more of a strengths focus approach? Why were those ones taken forward and rolled out and scaled up? Why, why were they scaled up? Yeah, so I think the one, the, they do a bit of analysis. The authors of the paper do a bit of analysis on this. And what they find is like, actually the ones that are shown to be more effective are the ones that are sort of more likely to be taken up, which I think is, is generally a win. Okay. It's not sort of cut and dry and probably not as clear as we would like it to be, but that is the case. So number one is I like, actually have something that works. Number two, I think one thing that sort of is really interesting that comes out of the paper is that if it's bolted, if it's part of an existing process, then that means that it's much more likely to be taken forward. Mm. And that, I think, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. If you reflect on why that is, it means that there's resources put forward um, that kind of allow that process to tick over. And are budgeted for, I suppose, in, in annual budgets. 100%. Particularly. Yeah. And then the other thing is that um, it's already part of the sort of organizational habit. So a lot of the decisions that we make are sadly more driven by inertia than I think we'd like to admit. Um, <laughs> And that, that rings true for organizations as well. So if there is a process, it's someone's job to do that, they already know what they're doing, it's just a case that we need to change some of the aspects of the, the copy, um, then that's pretty straightforward. So that's one of the key things that leads to adoption, is kind of organizational muscle memory. I find it fascinating, you know, terminology you're using, and we did that um, uh, episode on habits, yep. personal things. And one of the most successful um, ones is uh, piggybacking. So you already do something every day at the same time. So you introduce your new habit and, and you bond it to yeah. that. So what you're saying is if, if organize, you can scale this up to corporations, organizations, policy and what have you. If there's already something or a communication going out, if you piggyback on the back of that and, and you're not creating a new process, you're just adapting what's already there, then you're much more likely to be able to scale up a successful change program. Yeah, exactly. Huh. And it, I mean, that personal reflection, I think, is exactly the, the right one to have is that actually if you build something into your routine, then you personally are much more likely to do it as well. So, I mean, if you want to out and exercise more like change your pajamas to gym kit and then you're much more likely to that morning run because it's already part of your hang on a minute (laughs) that's a good one go to sleep in your gym kit and then just go straight up out and run we're working in pajamas in the bed um although i have extra tight lycra so it's not that comfortable in bed but i'm still going to try it (laughs) please don't put that thought on it it was interesting i was chat i was um so, so a, a, a behavioral scientist called Matt Wallert, I think his name is. I, apologies, Matt, if I've got your name wrong. He's from the US, and I'll, I'll tag him in this in case I mispronounced his name. But he was making the point that um, when you put these processes into businesses, all it takes is for a CEO or for a champion to leave, and that stops the behavioral science progressing. So, so in terms of that scaling up, often it's, it's down to, you know, you, you have to build them into the systems because the CEO who loves behavioral science leaves. If it's not in the system, then the behavioral science leaves with them um, is, is what I took from that. Yeah, I mean, and it's not just the CEO, right? It's, that's yeah. one thing that came out of the paper is that it's actually the person who's responsible for that area, and that can actually be someone on the front line. That could be someone in, in management, middle management, senior management, in the C-suite. Uh, that is, it's all sort of the individual that's driving that forward that is really critical. Actually, as a slight reflection, I think where we're seeing the use of behavioral insights more broadly, um, I mean, it's largely come out of government. We're seeing more in the private sector. And that is actually sort of my view on it is that it's driven by some very innovative and entrepreneurial individuals yep. who have been moving into those organizations and suddenly you see a shift in that organization. So it's the same thing that we're seeing seeing there. But yeah, the people, the people are really what matter in terms of driving it forward. That's what the paper found. That's fascinating. That really helps people strategize and how to implement these and make sure they're successful. But I know you've scaled up pilots in Britain, particularly with, let's say, with job seekers, Mm -hmm. that's been highly successful with the scaling up, but then you've taken it to other countries or other fields and and similar, um, uh, I suppose, um, you know, silos. Mm -hmm. Has it worked? Are you able to sometimes pick up these successful um, change programs and implement them elsewhere? Yeah, so the short answer is yes, but I think... Great, um, okay, yeah, moving (laughs) on. Bye. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll talk about that one, take it off. But I, I mean, I think the, the interesting question here and the discussion here is like, when you do scale up these ideas to a different setting, and I'll give the example of job centers in a second, is uh, are you taking the important components over? 
So I'm going to do a little bit of a history lesson uh, quickly. So James Lind, I'm not sure if that name rings a bell, he was basically uh, an officer in the in the Navy in the 1700s. Um, and th one of the key things that you saw there was that lots of people died at sea, and it largely wasn't due to combat, it was due to scurvy. scurvy so yeah. about 70% yeah. of a naval um, people in the Navy would, sailors would die um, because, of, because of scurvy. So James Lind did one of the first randomized control trials, or sort of randomized control trials that we kind of consider in, in modern history, where he took uh, 12 sailors and randomly allocated them to different treatments to address scurvy, and then saw whether or not the impact was there. Some of them were quite odd. So there's like some balsam, there's some chili uh, sauce that was given to some of them. Some, um, I think vinegar was one of the treatments. Uh, but the wrong. One, wrong, yes. <laughs> Good old grog. Um, but the key thing that was effective was actually citrus. Yep. So that was the key thing. That's why, you know, Americans would call people with accents like ours limeys, um, was the fact that actually citrus was... Is that where that comes from? Okay. Huh. Used to treat scurvy... Yeah. I knew you'd love that fact. Right? Yeah, yeah, I always wondered. You know, yeah. I'm like, where the um, words come from. So, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that, that's where it came from. But the interesting thing then is that after that was discovered and it was effective, what the naval, uh, what the navy then did was they, uh, in order to kind of take that to scale, was they boiled the lemon juice. It was actually lemons in this instance, uh, and then gave that out. The problem with that is that the boiling process actually disintegrates the yeah. vitamin C. Which is what stops the scurvy. So even though that sort of knowledge was gained and and sort of um, <clears throat> sort of clearly uh, scaled up in small scale, when it's taken uh, to the larger scale, sort of important aspects and the effective aspects are removed because of part of the process. So yeah. the way in which we try yeah. and overcome this is going back to the idea of like the behavioural formulation that I mentioned. Is do you look at the problem within a certain sort of um, framework and conceptualization around in the case of social norms? You know, is there a group of people who aren't doing what the large group of people are doing? And then can you use the sort of social norms, descriptive social norms to, to kind of get those people back into the wider group? Um, that's sort of key behavioral formulation, and that may exist in lots of different settings. So to go to your example on the job seeker stuff, which is pretty much where we first met, um, I think about a decade ago now, um, was we were working in Essex, looking at how we can get job seekers back into work. It's just what um, cool. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the key things that we we changed there was um, changing a lot of the paperwork to stop it focusing on what people had done to what will they do, which is a very, it sounds like a very basic and simple um, change. But the main reason is that if you're talking about what people have done, then that stuff can't really be changed, right? You can either punish people because they haven't done enough. You could probably coach them on how they could improve. But really, you know, if you've only got a short appointment, then that's sort of the way in which that conversation is going. Um, whereas if you focus on what people will do, then the skills that you have within that job coach can actually be used. Uh, and also the future is much more, much more malleable than the past. So that small change there, um, actually was, was part of a broader package of changes that we introduced. The other one being just a lot of simplification of the processes. So that you focus much more on the individual rather than on the paperwork. Um, but yeah, we found that that worked in Job Centre in, in Alton. We then also scaled it up across the whole of Essex and then ran a bigger trial where the results were slightly, I think, less uh, impressive, but much more bankable in terms of the fact that we knew that they were there. Um, and then we uh, came over to New South Wales to help set up a team in the New South Wales government. And one of the areas that they were looking at was the workers' compensation scheme. Um, and that behavioral formulation was actually pretty similar. It wasn't that people were out of work because they were unemployed or the, the GFC, it was because of an injury, but you still had a case manager whose role it was to help someone back into work and develop plans to do so. So that's when we started using the same ideas uh, and found similar results in terms of the fact that people were 27% faster in terms of returning to work just by using some of those same ideas. Yeah. Well, this is where it's, it's fascinating. One of the first order, the, the, the sources of inspiration in behavioral change programs or applying behavioral science to any problem that you're trying to address in an organization or a government department is an academic lit review and look for things that are similar, but in slightly adjacent or, or, yeah. or, or sometimes completely different fields. And then what can you apply uh, to this particular field? So having that capacity to scour the research is fascinating and, and absolutely essential. But I, I know most of the behavioral insights teams recruits and staff are generally from an Oxbridge background. Yeah, pressure cord. But which can be um, restrictive in terms of um, using graduates that have got 
brilliant uh, higher education experience and academic lit review skills. Um, but one of the key things I know you, you guys are really strong in doing is getting your consultants or your team out on the front line, learning face to face with your target groups or, or your participants or, or people actually that will end up having to implement these schemes. Is, is that is that still true? Uh, it's, it's, it's still true. I mean, I think we've probably got fewer Oxbridge candidates, uh, particularly in Australia, because yeah, um, <laughs> obviously there's fewer out here. But I mean, I think the point is right. Uh, uh, I mean. I say we've got a few Oxbridge graduates. It's partly because I think it's important we have a diversity of, of uh, backgrounds in our in our team. But yeah, generally they come from like a site background and they have spent a decent amount of time within the university system. Mm -hmm. You only have access to a certain amount of knowledge there. Right? You only have access to a very specific yeah. type yeah. of pointy headed pointy headed uh, knowledge. And like it would be absolutely ludicrous to assume that that is all knowledge that possibly exists. Quite often, some of the dirty secrets that we have is that some of the best ideas. Their genesis is very, very much in the front line, and it's due to a very entrepreneurial person who has been thinking about this, probably um, has a, a sort of a strong hunch or an intuition, but maybe doesn't have the backing of some of that literature that would then help them. And then we would come in and kind of marry what the issues are, what that sort of formulation is, uh, to what the literature says, and then kind of build that into the system. And that has a few benefits. One of them is that you just don't see things from the ivory tower, which could either be the C-suite, or Whitehall or you know, government, Canberra, um, that you do when you're out there in the front line. And actually just going out there creates a certain sense of humility. Um, mm -hmm. It also just allows you to kind of understand some of those issues in a bit more detail. It also builds more support for ideas if they come from the ground, because if you just kind of throw out an initiative and you don't have any champions and you don't know the name of those champions, then it's much more likely to fail, which is what we were talking about before. Um, so yeah, basically get out onto the front line, understand your issue from multiple perspectives and be humble in doing that. Yeah, I think that's that almost that IKEA effect or Sandra Lee. Yes. Um, yep. They found where, yes, 70% tops can come from externally, but if you've got 30% you're doing yourself, um, then you value that intervention a lot more. And as we've seen, for these um, uh, pilots to scale up properly, you need champions and you need people to run with it within the organization. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how you engage, you know, most of this or a lot of this is the genesis of this is your idea. Um, and we're just validating it. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think the IKEA effect of the framing is a little bit funny because it makes it feel like, Oh, yeah, I mean, it's a great idea, but obviously if we get that person to slap their name on it, then they'll like it more. Like, there are genuine ideas that come from that frontline process that actually make it a better idea mm. rather than a better idea that's just more likely to be taken up. Um, so actually one example from the Job Centre stuff that we did is that when we redesigned those forms, like, we looked at the old forms that were like, they didn't look that great. You know, the colour printing hadn't existed in those offices for quite some time, so we obviously, you know, got a designer to kind of make them look much better which the staff liked um when we were designing the booklets that people would write in their plans we were told you know it's it's essex it's going to be raining quite a lot so you know we want to make sure that that information is kept in a in a reasonable state because it was all done by paper which was actually quite a big step back and quite a big step back from uh policy at the time but we were doing these sort of mvps uh sort of minimal viable projects to kind of uh products to kind of see what we could do um so we bought these plastic sleeves, all right? And we put, you know, the ones that are like transparency. Yeah. Ones? yeah. And we got the booklets and we put them in there. And when we first handed them over to the office, they thought, this is great. You know, it's going to be really useful. We're protecting these, these plans. And then we come back in a couple of weeks. And there was like, like a humidity of hatred into the office. Like, you know, when you go into somewhere and you're like, I don't feel welcome here. Like, well, pretty here. much everywhere in my case. Well, well, it is, yeah. Well, especially when you come to the Gold Coast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but um, really, where's, 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 so the reason being is you know those plastic sleeves yeah they're a bit annoying to take things out in and out of right there's a lot of happening <laughs> with licking fingers and you've got to that, right? yeah. so these people had about four minutes per job seeker right these staff members had about a very short period of time to actually work with their job seekers if you're spending 30 seconds messing around with stationery mm. then that is an extra 13 percent of your day wasted all right so we got, we got rid of those those plastic sleeves had we taken that to scale immediately then that would have actually cost a huge amount just in terms of stationary but a much bigger amount in terms of staff time wow so it's sort of micro adjustments that you get through this this prototyping process um and that is you know just a component 
of the rollout rather than the sort of crux of the idea. And then when we actually designed them, you know, we understood the terminology and the language that staff use and job seekers use. And you really got to focus on that, uh, not in terms of, you know, is it English or is it another language, but like actually the type of English that you use in any organization will differ organization by organization or different parts of the organization. So you really want to pay attention to that. Like uh, the sprinkling of Essex slang here that they've yeah. got, here, what have you been doing, in it? <laughs> before, oh, we, now I know you're asking. <laughs> before we finish today, Jens, I was going to ask you in a few minutes uh, a few things. There's so much we could cover, but a few things I wanted to ask you was, was probably just your funniest or, or strangest nudges I was going to ask you in a few minutes. I was also going to ask you then, how can people listen to our podcast? Can you use nudge theory in your day-to-day -day life, whether it's at work or with the schools or something like that? And I know, Darren, you've got a new question for each of our guests right at the very end. But, uh, but before we finish it and come to all of that, um, just quickly, mate, Behavioral Insights team, we, we did talk about the fact it was created, uh, you know, 2010, 2011 um, by the British government. It's actually now scaled up around the world, isn't it, what you do? So you're, you're, you, you lead the Australian team, is that right? And, and But you have... Um, offices now in locations around the world doing your work and no longer part of the British government, uh, owned independently. Um, but clearly what you're doing is having a massive impact on the world. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, these ideas work and they are, you know, scaled up, not as much as we'd like, but they definitely do hold, um, I guess, lots of people's uh, interests uh, and generally do social good. So, yeah, we're we're around to help different organizations do that. The key thing for us is that it has a social purpose. Uh, in terms of what you can do uh, to apply these to your own personal life or an organization that you might be working with or for, or, you know, um, yeah, uh, is that you can look at some of our tools that we've created. So the EATS framework is something that we put out in about 2014, which focuses on here's a short guide of some of the behavioral ideas that we've been talking about. Um, and here's some things that you can do with that. So EAST stands for easy. So the key thing is if you want to change someone's behavior, then make sure it is as easy as possible for them to do so. Yep. Um, yep. The A stands for attractive, uh, which isn't necessarily just make it bright and shiny. It's actually make sure that the key messages that you want to get out there attract the most attention. Right. Um, or anything that you want, you know, make sure that any incentive that you're offering is actually attractive to that individual. Um, S is social, which we've covered quite a lot already. Um, and then the T is timely. So right. if you're introducing an initiative, a program, a service, product, uh, think about when you are doing so. And um, not just, I guess, when in terms of your own lifetime or life cycle, think about the people that you are working with or whose behavior you're trying to change and think about what does this mean in terms of their sort of life cycle, their habits, their, their routine. And, and and so, Darren, in, in that day-to-day -day life piece, um, aside from getting your sons to we in the right place, have you, do you actually use it? I mean, you're a behavioral scientist. Do you use it in your daily life with, with, in any other way, particularly around parenting? Yes, there's millions I could go into. But... <laughs> Hang on, do, do you, are you using it on me right now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, you beautiful man. <laughs> it's a very good question. I'm glad you asked me. Oh, shit. I, I feel like <laughs> I've been duped for the last 10 years by you now, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tiffany. <laughs> No, that's a, a whole different thing. My wife's better at implementing behavioural change in, in the children than me. And she tells me, you know, just, you know, he's shouting, he's screaming. One of the most interesting things I've I've learned is is looking at indigenous or, or hunter-gatherer groups around around the world. And and if you get angry with a child and, and they're frustrating the hell out of you. Um, it's very rare to see them getting angry at their child because it's humiliating for an adult because that kid's brain hasn't developed yet. And, 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 and um, some Inuit, uh, which I think is still the, the appropriate term for some of the um, uh, people living near the Arctic Circle, but um, they say it's, it's humiliating for you as an adult to lower yourself because their brain isn't developed yet, and yet yours is. So what you should expect them to play up. You should expect them to scream and throw a tantrum. So don't get annoyed because that's you having your own baby brain. Um, yeah. and, and just you're, you're an adult, so just tolerate it put up with it and 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 sort of be aloof from it all. And that's something I, I just, whenever my kid screams, I feel the scream in my gut 
and it and it go permeates my very being and i become tense like the scream and it's just my wife can do this brilliantly and i'm trying to learn to not get wound up by by my kids and be like humans are or, or have been throughout the rest of the world and just um for for, for most of history and just go okay the, the brain's just not developed and they, of course they're going to behave like this and it helps yeah. you contextualize things yeah yeah <laughs> i'm not sure if that works because you know my twins are now 21 mate but it's um, <laughs> yeah. um well you know the prefrontal cortex hasn't finished developing which inhibits certainly, uh, certainly on my son yeah, um so, so <laughs> well what's what, what uh, we'll talk again in a few minutes and i know we probably do a whole nother podcast on this maybe a little bit on where to from here with behavioral science the funniest or most exciting um unusual nudges that you've come across oh I've just been racking my brain, to be honest, in terms of the funniest. I mean, I think because the areas we work in, nothing ends up being too funny. I think it's the process of just working with a broad range of people mm. that you end up having lots of different experiences with that you just don't don't really expect. Um, and actually going through the front line of understanding what do these processes look like and feel like leads you to quite different experiences. Um, so we did some work in, in New Zealand again, looking at how we can get people to uh, follow their bail notices um, and the, one of the team members that we had over there uh, ended up just spending a night in the drunk tank to understand what does that sort of process look like on a Saturday night in Wellington. Wow. Uh, all being discharged. He wasn't drunk at the time, but or at least that's what he told me. Um, but I think it's really important. <laughs> all part of the research. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you get that, that. It's not really lived experience, right? Because you, as an outsider, can never really experience what it feels like to go through that process. But I think it's just invaluable to kind of understand things from the ground as much as possible. So I'm giving you a really funny laugh out loud story, but I think yeah. you can imagine, yeah. I guess, how this process does lead to, Absolutely. I guess, different experiences that allow you to come up with better ideas. I love it. And, and the lemons, the um, the, the plastic mm. sleeves, the eyes, they're, it's they're fascinating, all... isn't it? Fascinating one. I think my most frustrating one, having just come back from a couple of months in the States, is uh, friction, how you can add and so most of what we've been trying to do and I try and do with clients is reduce friction in form filling or, or text responding. Um, but it's been added in in the States when you try and uh, pay for anything and they put in, right, do you want 18, 20 or 22 percent gratuity added? And to 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 nothing because you've just been in a self-service canteen um there's, there's a little tiny thing in the corner that you can barely see and and the person at the checkout is staring at you for, for you to put <laughs> other amount and it's like, oh bloody hell this is so embarrassing and even if i put 18 i'm almost offending these people bloody 20 percent. and it's like why did i just tip you a fifth of what i've just paid uh, when yeah. i've had to serve myself you know it's, it's insane so that, oh, mate, there's, a, there's a whole is podcast a on americans getting paid properly <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, so that term is known in the, in the literature as sludge. So it's sort of like the opposite <laughs> yeah. of, of nudge and something that cast <laughs> unseen. Yeah. Well, that's it, right? Is there, And there's purposeful sludge that kind of does that, all this stuff that just appears because I think a lot of processing systems, they yeah. just sort of entropy and they fall apart and there's lots of different things that are thrown in. So actually in the job center stuff, one of the simplification things that we found is that I think there were like seven forms and it required 11 signatures in order for you to set up your benefits. And when you kind of looked at it, what had happened was that there was one form to start off with, and then there was a legislative change, which meant that the top half of it was no longer useful, but they already had millions of copies of it printed out, so it'd be irresponsible <laughs> to get rid of them. So you print a cover sheet, right? But the cover sheet only covers the top half of it, so you need to sign both to make sure that you've read both. And then there's a change that happens to paragraph three on the original page. So you're like, well, you've got to add another cover sheet now, right? So you have this sort of just falling apart of these systems that just stack up and stack up. Mm. So some of that sludge is is very much purposeful. And some of it just sort of happens. Accumulates like sludge does. Well, we we what, should change the name of this podcast from budge to sludge. I quite like that. It's beats budge, which I've called it the other day, I think, on one of our episodes. And budge. Yeah. That's a completely different podcast. Yes. Um <laughs> what's what's the future of behavioral sides, Alex? Where to from here? Because you got you guys have come from this sort of small beginnings in um uh, you know, London, now global. So what, what's the future of behavioral insights, do you think, and, and behavioral science more broadly? Yeah, big question. Uh, so actually, I'm going to plug another a piece of work that's just about to come out, uh, which is our manifesto for what the next 10 years of behavioral science will look like. Mm -hmm. So I won't spoil that too much, but that's coming out pretty soon, written by Michael Horsworth, who's there, actually ran those original tax trials. Um, I mean, 
there's quite a lot of different things going on, right? At the same time, there's a sort of debate on whether or not sort of nudges work, which I think is not frankly that interesting because like some of these things do work, some of them don't. You got to keep testing, but it's sort of meaningless just to say, does it work? Does it not? Um, but I think that sort of conversation will keep bubbling on. We'll get better at understanding what works and in what so, sort of what circumstances and contexts. I think we're seeing a lot of different um, methodologies being used at the same time. So actually, five years ago, we put out a report on how data science and behavioral science can work together and found some interesting ideas there. I feel like that will keep going. We're also doing a lot of stuff on human-centered design and how that fits into behavioral science. And those sort of things are pretty closely linked. I mean, the, the stuff that you're talking about in terms of going out to see the front line, we also wrote a paper on that called Explore um, that's, again, freely available. Um, but that... That talks about how these ideas can work together. So essentially, how do we build these ideas and come up with new solutions by kind of putting them, putting them into interesting new contexts? So I think that's sort of the main interesting space for us to be. The other thing is, you know, how do we mainstream this as much as possible? Yeah. Um, big one, isn't we it? move from, you know, a small group of people with number 10 to 200 odd. That's still not enough. I reckon the community is probably in the sort of tens of thousands, but we can still get bigger. And I think what, where we really want to get to is that every government department will have a chief psychologist or a chief behavioral scientist. Same things for most, you know, publicly listed companies. I'd imagine that they will in the next maybe 10 years yeah. be looking at having a chief behavioral scientist to think about how you can use these ideas more effectively and really mainstream it. So we don't, you know, it's no longer that sort of faddish thing. It's just standard business. Um so yeah, I think that's that's really where we're where we're looking. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, mate. The opportunities for business are incredible in the coming years. It literally, my, my organisation is nothing like the size of the ones you're talking about, but we we're you know we are seriously looking at bringing a behavioural scientist so we can change you know how we can help apprentices, job seekers, school students, uh, a whole range of you know clientele. We think we can make huge differences with behavioural science. Yeah, um, Darren, we 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 have a wrap up question, mate, that, that oh. we've been discussing for a while. Well, yes, I'm trying to remember this. What we should have prepped him because he won't be able to come up with anything off the top of his head. Uh, what human behaviour annoys you the most, frustrates you the most? Ooh. Apart from podcast hosts asking ridiculous questions. No, no. I mean, I think one of them that, I mean, I've been in Sydney for, for, for nine years now. The thing that I find slightly infuriating is um, <laughs> people just don't move down trains. Do you know, like, oh, they yeah. stand right near the doors, and it's yeah. all over. And it's that really is so annoying. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Hang on, can you have slightly? What did you say? It's you sort of slightly infuriating. <laughs> you can't have a slightly infuriate. You're either infuriated or not. No, but there's, there's. I mean, <laughs> it's a British way of being infuriated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's the quiet ceiling, right? I mean, you can, can just yeah, angrily pass the whole body. Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> on the on the, with your whole body, I just get it's brilliant. But yeah, I mean, it's. It's an interesting one, right? Because there's obviously social norms that are at play. There's also just the built environment. Like the trains are built in a way that actually funnel you into the middle, right? Whereas if you think about most of the tube lines in, in London, you can move through them a lot more easily. There's only one story, so you don't have the stairs sort of blocking mm. you off. So it, it's a behavioral problem, right? Because it's the, the environment and the social, so the physical and the social environment coming into play. But yeah. So, <laughs> I love it. The next behavioral insights project, getting people to move down trains. Yeah. <laughs> Alex, True. thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. This has been absolutely fascinating and, and uh, re really do appreciate you taking the time. Um, anything to add, Darren, before we wrap up? No, just, just tell them where to subscribe. Where subscribe, they subscribe mate? <laughs> I don't know. You always say this bit. How do I know? I've not if, embedded it in my head. <laughs> if you like this podcast, we have lots more. So uh, please subscribe on YouTube down below. Um, or also go to our Facebook group. Got it right, Baz? <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Is that Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Paul. Marvellous. Great talking to you both. See you soon. Bye. Oi, budge!